Welcome to Turek Books Podcast. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Joshua Turek. We're never going to read all the books we want, but when someone tells us about a book, that's its own valid form of experiencing it. Our guests come in to talk about the books that left lasting marks on them as readers, and that becomes a springboard to who they are, who I am, and maybe who all of us are. So sit back, relax, and enjoy it, and who knows, maybe you'll end up grabbing a book or two. Maybe you've read some of them, and it's nice to hear someone else talk about them. We want this to be like a book club, but without the guilt. Welcome to Turek Books Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to have our two guests. This is our first two-guest session, and it couldn't have been a better duo. The comedy team behind Content.Channel, Cam George and Peter Ditzler. How are you? Great. Yeah, great. Thanks for having us on. And also, real quick, do you want to introduce us just for people who may be listening in their cars? They've also been helping us on the show, helping us produce the show. They've We're the been, audio engineers and video. Yeah. So if you 14 have, years in the industry each. <laughs> yes. It, well, but, yeah. Since 2019, we've been learning how to make audio sound atrocious in cars. In cars specifically, yeah. we've had a couple complaints about the way the podcast sounds in cars. And so, if you do want to forward those over to Content Dot Channel, you are welcome to. We will check DMs and respond <laughs> to them accordingly. Yeah, we'll own up to it. That's we'll gracious. Take the blame. That's gracious of you guys. We appreciate that. But yeah, they've been instrumental in helping us, helping me get this podcast off the ground um, and just kind of get my wrap my head around it. So uh, I thought, what better guests than them to come on and talk books? Since so uh, that's what we've been doing this whole time. And dare I say, your first Gen Z guests? <clears throat> I think we just tapped into a new market. We've crossed that bridge. Yeah. Because, Pete, let's hold them up to the respective cameras. Josh, what are we holding? I don't know. These are called Amazon Kindles, sponsored by Amazon, powered by Amazon Technologies, and funded by Amazon <laughs> Technologies. But, dude, we've been trying to get you on Kindles for a long time yeah. because, as I've said, it like this really got me into reading, actually, because it makes reading feel like going on my phone. Fair. So you're scrolling yeah. and you get the same sensations. It's like, uh, you know, s smoking one of those like Nicorette vapes or something, right? Exactly. Yeah. Or Zins. Zins for reading. Well, it's like, yeah. come on. It's like I'm, it's a bigger screen than my phone and I can press it. That right. feels good because that like addictive nature of like, yeah, scrolling going on your phone, I don't know what else to replace that with. Because it's more of like a push than a pull of a page, which and, like think oh. about like the physics behind that, like a push just feels more intuitive. You're I shoving think. open that door. Yeah. And also, guys, the thing about the Kindle is you can link it to your library account. So I've spent zero dollars on actual books. What you have to do is just find the, the e the it's e like, reader version yeah it's like libby is the app on your phone or i think even on the computer or you just do yeah. it through the uh like the la library website you can reserve your books and connect them or send them to your kindle and then it's like you have three weeks the same <laughs> amount of time as We're a library doing like alone. a 10 minute ad for amazon right now <laughs> no, no, it's, I'm like, there, is no, there is no irony i genuinely this is like it got me back into reading i love it so much um, before a flight, I'll download like 20 books from the library. And it's funny because sometimes it'll be like one of two copies available. Yeah, and there are limited copies <laughs> of you e, have them. e yeah. copies. You're hoarding so copies. Yeah. We pilfer the library <laughs> before we go on any kind of like plane, plane yeah. flight. Just loot it. It's crazy. But I mean, that's the most persuasive argument right there. So you pretty much have access to every book ever written that you could ever want for free. And you're helping the libraries because I know that their numbers of books checked out and all those things go into the data with their funding. You don't get the joy of going to a library. The hunt, the, the treasure hunt thrill of finding your book. I, I, I went to go find my book and it told me the section it was in and I had to find the numbers and I grabbed it and then I got to check out, a, see a few more that caught my eye. and. Um, there is a thrill to that, yeah. bro. We're 25. We don't. We're not literate with the Dewey Decimal System. Yeah, fair. I can't. Fair. I can't begin around in a library. <laughs> well, I, I love it, and it's persuasive. And I think a lot of the people listening and watching probably do read on these e-readers. So I like bringing a new perspective on. Look, we can all 
this is what the world needs. We need to talk about our differences and be okay with others' differences. And you guys definitely have me intrigued too. The library thing, the Libby app, that that's really persuasive. Yeah. And and the scrolling thing, quite honestly, I'm I'm addicted to my phone, and so to take that and kind of channel it into a, a much more f- pleasurable uh, experience seems like a great idea. Yeah. And I, oh, what were you saying? And would, it got you into reading. I mean, yeah. boom, there was your door in. And it, it got us in. And the thing is, now <laughs> it's like you can read a book, take a chance on an author without having to feel bad about like the money aspect of it. And if you really, like you said, if you really like a book. I'll just buy it, not to read, but just to have it like spiritually as yeah. like kind of like a thing in my house, a, like the a energy memento of it. For, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Peter, what what are the books that got you into reading? Have you been reading since you were young? Uh, I think I'd started reading when I was very young uh, and then, you know, tapered off in yeah. high school and everything. And then even like I would read everything for assignments in college. I think I was like pretty on top of that, but I just was never reading outside of it for fun or like choosing my own picks. Uh, and then, you know, I took a gap year after college, wasn't reading, I feel like. And then I think essays definitely got me back into uh, reading. I think for me, it was like finding chunks that I could read and knock out in a in a timely manner and then feel like I was accomplishing something more. So it was like nice reading like these bits of a larger work, but feeling like I was accomplished with every like chapter. Um, so like I think like Joan Didion was the main thing that got me back into reading, especially as I was like uh, getting ready to move to LA. Uh, and I think like slouching towards Bethlehem was, uh, would be one of my picks. I don't even have it with me today. Yeah. Uh, it's back home. But I remember reading that, especially like the uh, essay about San Francisco in the sixties and her following the, the hippie counterculture. I remember reading that and being like blown away by the writing and just how, like vivid it is uh and that definitely got me back and then i moved to la and our neighbor justine introduced us to eve babbitt's yeah which was amazing yeah like a a more fun (laughs) a more fun joan didion yeah for for sure both great and pete you got me into joan didion yeah i was hesitant at first with um slouching towards bethlehem but then oh god what's the one it's like the white cover with the blue white album white album so good yeah Yeah. amazing yeah i mean so concise so to the point she just sees through things so well yeah and gets to the real like was slouching toward bethlehem that was essays right yeah was did she write that essay about the water in california and how it makes its way down to la through the owens valley river was that in there i was just the way she the way she dramatizes it and makes it compelling is like so good um, just, just the way we get that stolen water and how we do and the history of it. Yeah. It's just like amazing journalism, but Eve Babbitts is a great transition yeah. because you're right. She's kind of like a more fun, carefree LA, um, writer who documents the day and age that she's living in. Was it seventies? Yeah. LA seventies. That were the, the I, heyday. I, I heard the quote where it's like Eve Babbitts is like in the party and then Joan Didion is like on about like watching the party or yes. something. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and I mean, you know, these are uh, two very popular authors. Eve Babbitt's, is, her popularity has surged probably in the last 10 years or so, and really impactful. Like, I still remember, I, I think she writes about food really well. Yeah. She writes about those taquitos Great, you can get in oh, Olvera yeah. Street, and I, like, think about it all the yeah. time. I'm like, man, I, I want to go get some taquitos yeah. that, like, Eve Babbitt's wrote about. The essay in this about going to a ball game with, like, her like the guy she was seeing at the time where he took her and like she had no interest in baseball and then just like falling in love with baseball or like the Dodgers at the at the game oh, itself. And just like fun kind of vignettes like that were just like, oh, this is, there's so much, I like it's so uh, dumb to like pin it specifically to LA, but it's just like she really brings out kind of like the, the simple joys of life and like the way you can encounter joy and love but yes. also like what world were they living in when it's like i swear to god every time i read joan didion she's talking about like flying up the freeway like she would just go driving for fun <laughs> and i'm like this is in la yeah well there okay. used to be times of day in la even when i was a kid where people wouldn't be on the road really wow. you didn't have amazon delivery you didn't have uber you didn't have postmates you didn't have so many cars that never How did stopped. people eat food without yeah. postmates you grew it yeah, oh, you okay. grew it in your on your 
in your but, backyard. But then that's raw, right? It is raw, yeah. And then, we didn't have fire back then. Okay. We just had stronger guts. Well, it's also interesting reading, um, like Babbitt's and then Dugan's work, where they're trying, or like sometimes they're like name dropping like people from whenever, and I'm just like, I don't know who any of these people are. <laughs> President Nixon, who? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, what? Yeah, I, I know it is interesting, and it does speak to like what makes writing timeless and what makes it more to its Taquitos era. Taquitos are timeless. Taquitos yeah. are timeless, and I think that place is, that stand is still there, and I think they might even have a new location. But um, yeah, it, it is true, and sometimes you got to just like roll with the vibe of the name. You're like, okay, I think I understand yeah. who this person's vibe, what their vibe is, even if I don't know who they are. I have been reading this other LA book called Dear LA, and it's like a collection of letters and journal entries from people who, who wrote them when they were visiting LA or lived here. And it just like threw the, the city's existence uh, over the years. And it's like chronological by date or like day of the year. So it's like January 1st all the way to December 31st. And it just like little snippets from different years and different authors. And it's like fun getting to see the random name at the end of each passage and like getting to investigate someone else who was like critical to LA history or like yeah had oh, are these all books. authors or are they like random they're all random like there's like stuff from like Reagan book. or like yeah there's just like different playwrights too like Christopher Isherwood I'd never heard yeah. of before <laughs> I have a bunch of his books sitting at, at, at home that I haven't dug into yeah lived in Santa Monica um, wrote these huge dense journals yeah. Um, diary entries was his good yeah i mean his stuff it's like it's all scattered throughout so it's like each passage is from an entirely different person um it's like little tweets yeah from people, which oh is, really yeah and they just keep marrying all these different perspectives together exactly yeah oh, interesting really awesome the uh i remember the the night the post 9 11 passage <laughs> it was like from it was like for the september 12th uh it was taken from 2001 and it was just some I can't remember if it was anyone like that notable, but it was just someone talking about like that the attacks just happened and like uh, they noticed how nice they were to another driver on the street that day or like how they, they were kind of patient towards another driver. And it's just like, it's funny to see like historic dates and see kind of how the the editor, like the uh, the author who combined compiled all this, like decided to which years he'd pick from. Um, yeah, he's making which, his own like genres. playlist. Yeah, it's yeah. awesome. It's a he. Yeah. Yeah, and like how how cool. And I mean that's a thing about LA and Eve Babbitts and what you're talking about is like there is a real dreaminess and when you have a good day in this city, you go to the yeah. beach, you come back a little sun kissed, but you get tacos on the way home and you are with good company. Like it, it, you go to a Dodger game and watch the sunset behind the Elysian Hills and yeah. Uh, the palm trees and the the sounds of of the ballpark like you can have a real dreamy romantic time in the city when it goes right for you yeah like i love reading this and seeing like these dreamy passages after a long day that i spent in an office <laughs> it's like nice to experience la through other people's perspectives i'm glad they're having after fun a nine to five well yeah. that's how they get to have fun yeah exactly yeah, we work so. for them <laughs> passive income but those days that I get to do it on the weekends occasionally are pretty nice. Yeah, right? <laughs> those beach days are make it all worth it. Yeah, so true. They really do. I remember when I first moved to LA in like 2019 and I was kind of living near Chinatown and I didn't really know the city that well at all. I didn't really know that many people. It's like I would skateboard around and it was okay. But then it was really when me and Pete moved back together after the pandemic in 2021 that it's like, you know, once we had a car and you could actually then drive to the beach and stuff, it was like, oh, the city completely opened up. Yeah. Even though we do not support you cars. Can, you can like cars. It's okay. We just don't like the people who listen to podcasts in those cars. In the cars. Those yeah. are the yeah. people we have a real grudge with. Yeah. Yeah. It, it does open up for you. And it just opens up for you as you learn each neighborhood and you have good experiences in each yeah. pocket. You're, you There's a fondness that grows. It's really cool. And there's just such an endlessness to it. Yeah. And there's an endlessness to the amount of perspectives that you can see the city. Like all these hikes and like just, you know, taking a glance at it from like a completely different angle. Totally. And yeah. same with the ocean. You can be right up against it or every different little grade in the hillside that you're on viewing it. It changes how beautiful it is, but it's always beautiful. Yeah. No, it's, I mean, I've lived here pretty much my whole life and um, I'm still discovering new pockets of this city and yeah. I'm like, what? This is here? I, and I didn't know about it. Uh, yeah, I don't know if we said, but yeah, we're from Pennsylvania. Yeah, we should have okay. prefaced that. <laughs> no, no. 
Well, more, more the Vania part, not as much the Pencil yeah. part. <laughs> We're in the <laughs> suburbs of Philly, and it's like it's funny going coming from such like a historic place and like the country's history, but then moving to LA, that's like so new and like. I don't, this history is just so much more fun <laughs> right because it's just I, like all the creative people come move here and then get to spin their narrative about it and so it's just like it's automatically kind of more exciting than just <laughs> it's on the fly yeah <laughs> it feels like a little shanty town when you've been somewhere that more established yeah and um you know i i always bring this up like the u.s defeated mexico for california in 1848 where universal studios now stands yeah. it's an absurd place to live yeah. it's strange and that was only you know 1848 it wasn't that long ago um so yeah ever changing and the geology is always crumbling and you have these people who are kind of crumbling these volatile artists and yeah. so it's like a very it's an ever-changing environment um yeah that just has a lot more to it uh than sort of the cliches uh, but the cliches are here too. Yeah, that's, well, it, and it that's is so cool how part. it's like, yeah, it attracts so many people coming to the city with like a different vision for something. Right. And that's like the craziest. And this is coming from do you guys coming from a state that ends in Vania. Like, what other state? <laughs> that's the only one I yeah, think, right? The only. <laughs> the one in. Uh, the only there's uh, Alaska Vania. Yeah. No, yeah, yeah, Maine yeah. Vania. Maine Vania. <laughs> Um, no, that's that's true. I think I heard the fact like one out of only one out of a hundred people in LA work in show business. Yeah, that's the other thing. So you, the so majority funny. of people here are just normal people. Yeah, yeah. Like it's like moving here and then like driving to the beach and being like, who are all these cars? And then realizing, oh, this is like this is just a city. This just is city. <laughs> this normal is a people. city where there's lots of people who have nothing to do with what we're but trying the, to do. But the loud people, they're loud. Yeah, they stick yeah, out, exactly. and they definitely. Um, hit the mark on all the things people make fun of about this city. Yeah. Well, I think that was a great introductory book. I think that got us into uh, where we're at right now. Yeah. We're in L.A. We're talking about L.A. Yeah. Crazy history. And you brought up the uh, the river thing, Pete. Th yeah. This is another um, book Pete put me on, The Mirage Factory. Yeah. This was a book, like the first kind of, or well, no, I, yeah, I guess like the first like L.A. history book that I read uh, and it frames it around like three of the most influential people in LA's early years. Uh, it's D.W. Griffith, uh, as notorious as he was, uh, William O'Holland, and then Amy Semple McPherson. And they're all three people that I was vaguely familiar with. Uh, D.W. Griffith, I guess, was the one after I was the most book, familiar with. <laughs> yeah, I was vaguely familiar even after. <laughs> 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 kind of gave me the outline of these people. Uh, no, those people are, they fit really well. Yeah. I mean, the, the cover of it says Illusion, Imagination, and the Invention of Los Angeles, and truly. Yeah. The uh, wild orator that was Amy Semple McPherson, she was like this captivating um, orator, yeah. evangelist, right? Yeah, and she brought all the or like so many of the early people to LA so like the people who weren't even here for it, the entertainment like stuff they'd hear on the radio yeah so imagine like the biggest twitch streamer you can think <laughs> of right now and then imagine like them just being Christian yeah yeah like Hardcore. bringing people here straight up an influencer yeah. yeah maybe the first one I don't know but I'm she was cool. also so much about like love and like um, bringing people together and then yeah. there was like this counter evangelist who this male this guy i can't no one remembers his name but he was much more like hell and uh i vaguely remember uh brimstone or whatever the expression is but yeah. there was a thing so like she came here and then yeah an echo parker temples there that people just built like people she didn't they built her a house that like she was fully taken care of by her fan base and then towards the end of it, it like this book kind of touches on how she was like kidnapped in the desert and that was like a big conspiracy because then she kind of like went missing and it was like all supposedly or potentially a ploy to hide her affair that she was having yeah. and so it was just like someone who was like had to adhere to like the the religion that she was like preaching uh and had to like kind of a stage of kidnapping potentially i mean allegedly a fallen uh, idol yeah which this town loves to build up and break down yeah as far as when i say this town you know like the the media part of it yeah it wasn't it that they said she was kidnapped and then in mexico brought down to mexico but then they found her up in carmel like central california or something like that yeah yeah she might have been having an affair yeah and then william mulholland yeah the man responsible for engineering the the mechanisms that bring us the stolen water right yeah exactly and i had no idea that there were like straight up water wars 
right yeah. with it's the like farmers people, in yeah. the Owens Valley, right? Just like blowing sh- stuff up, <laughs> straight up like um, devastating a uh, local economy. This town like stealing all their water, and then they just got cooked. It, well, and then hit one of his dams burst, yeah. right? Yeah. Yes. Later in in the game, and a lot of yeah. people theorize it was an act of terrorism by the people who he yeah. stole water from in the first place. And that yeah. dam yeah. bursting flooded a whole section of like more east. East, east, yeah, outside of Horr- LA, horrifying passage. Like reading about that, yeah, crazy. This people, book gets into it, yeah. People's homes being swept away in the middle of the night. So it's like you just literally wake up in water, <laughs> or you don't wake <laughs> like up, yeah, or you go to yeah. sleep you and that's it. Yeah, wow. So that this book really gets into those details. Yeah. So it like kind of uh, it follows like the arc of all these three people's lives because D.W. Griffith has a downfall too, and it's like. Yeah, just the way that they all firmly like establish their role in the city and help bring, make it what it is today. But then it's just like they're all pretty pretty flawed in their own ways. Um, or like they yeah they they became defeated by their own kind of their own passion projects. Yeah, um, they all got brought down because D.W. Griffith made Birth of a Nation. Yeah. He was the filmmaker. Um, I heard he would ride his horse to set. Like that's how early L.A. was yeah. still. And mind you, like early colonized LA, like we're mm-hmm. not that far from when this place was colonized by the Spanish and then by what's now the United States. And so like, this is such a new experiment and f- city and format. And, but we take it, we like just walk through it in acceptance. But yeah, there were these people who, who kind of uh, had public notoriety in the building of what this was. And then, yeah, it wasn't D.W. Griffith. He he ended his life in like a tiny little boarding house yeah. in a, the Knickerbocker or something in Hollywood. Yeah, he got like shut out of the industry that he helped build essentially. Uh, like even as as rough as his films might be to like watch an hour, uh, like it's, he got- And when you say watch, you truly mean watch because there was no sound, right? That's true. You really had to- you <laughs> Like had you're your just looking. Yeah. And, and the world moved on. From all of these people, really, I yeah. guess, is what. Yeah. Uh, they took what they could and they moved on, which is, yeah, part of that whole uh, ultra capitalism that I go on and on about with LA. Yeah. Um, the excavation of everything that can be mined from whoa, a person on, or an whoa, idea. Whoa, whoa, are we getting into Mike Davis now? Good. That's what it sounds like. Oh, damn. <sighs> I mean, I've done it on the podcast before. I We've don't know talked if I'm afraid him, so of doing it again. We could just say, I guess, that. Uh, ecology of fear if you haven't read that book by mike davis so good yeah yeah we we only talked about city of courts on here with chris estrada so ecology of fear that's a great one to get into that's more of like the relationship the city has with like the like nature because i mean what like it is crazy thinking when people were living here when the city first started it's like they were hunting off their doorsteps and stuff and like there was so much wildlife and like there still is a lot of wildlife and it works with the city in crazy ways. Like, you know, we have like P22, like the a mountain, mountain lion. Or he passed away. Yeah, but they, we had him. And he we, that mountain lion would hunt deer on the golf course. He would eat koalas at the zoo. I mean, and they- What other well, city has that? That's what Ecology of Fear gets into is they exterminated the grizzly bear, the California bear, uh, California brown bear. Um, the yeah. grizzly bear. before before yeah. the 20th century right yeah uh like it happened I think really into the quick. early 1900s yeah even. and they killed the yeah i think they killed the last one in the early 1900s but yeah they this was like the hunting game capital of north america for yeah. a while it was plentiful with birds and small mammals large ones they killed all the grizzly bear in a concerted effort to bring this sort of ma- evil manifest destiny control everything vibe here and then the mountain lions they tried and they could they failed. Try as humans have, mountain lions are too good. They yeah. failed. And the thing that really stuck with me with that, where he was kind of saying like the first recorded mountain lion attack on humans was like in the seventies or something. So a lot of it was just made up stuff about like why they were so dangerous and they needed to be hunted. And he was almost saying it's crazy that like because they were pushed almost to the point of extinction, that the mountain lions that survived, like their genes were just nuts. Like, like these the, were the craziest the predators. Ones. So it's like the like P twenty two is a descendant of just yeah, an evolved ultimate. version that has yeah, to fight just for crossing like three the sleekiest. They're leveled sleekiest. up now, dude. They've they've yeah. totally just been like buffed by. We've got to nerf them at this point. I mean, they are just <laughs> they're not they're too anywhere. op. And the coyotes, I mean, are, are just thriving. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we can never take down the coyotes. Well, you bringing that concerted effort up 
it's all it was also because of the cattle they brought the oh, cattle yeah. industry here and they didn't the bears in the mountain lines would eat the cattle so there was a financial prerogative to get rid of the wildlife we can't control for the one that they could um which yeah is pretty grisly and if i do say so which is uh, me and pete's favorite chapter in the book which i think is one of my favorite chapters of any book i've ever read which is called the case for letting malibu burn yeah it's like unbelievable he just dissects like why malibu like why it burns like the history of that whatever and then how the like the process of pe- like these million dollar mansions burning down and then being rebuilt with like taxpayer money and it's like as like a status thing it's crazy as as macarthur park area westlake area in the inner city of la all these old buildings yes. were built w- with poor codes yeah. and people were getting caught in fires there and how little resources were given to them suffering fires to compared to the wealthy homeowners in Malibu, which he rightfully calls the wildfire capital of North America and probably the world. Yeah. It burns yeah. more than anywhere else in the it's, world. It's not hospitable. There's no way there. to make no. it not burn. Yeah. Right. It's meant to burn. Yeah. yeah. And we're not meant to live there. And that's what he's saying. My friends do live there and, the, and they lost a, a couple houses in the fire and they've started like a community brigade and they've undergone certification for fire hardening homes. And basically what goes into that is just managing everything around the home to make sure that it's sealed. There's nothing, there's not a rose bush too close, whatever. And I was talking to my friend about it and he said, he's telling me all these details and I'm like, so you just see this now nonstop, huh? He's like, we were in a grocery store and he's like, dude, I'm looking at these tote bags right here. I'm looking at everything as a means of will it, will my house catch it on fire if it's here and exposed like this? And yeah, it's, um, so that level is pretty intense. Do they have a GoFundMe? We could, I think they probably, I, yeah. <laughs> uh, right. It's like, uh, on yeah. top of the taxes, I'd love to. I know, I know. It, yeah. More. It's, uh, and yet like, you know, it's a beautiful place to live if you have the means, I guess. Yeah. Um, I still have no idea what the hell it is, like Malibu. It, what yeah. it is? Like when I when I first came to LA, I was like, oh, Malibu's like so sad. It's like this like beach town, like, and I went. I'm like, this is just a highway. Yeah, no, it's a rugged coastline yeah. of immense beauty yeah. that's gate kept by a lot of wealthy people. Yeah. I know when my parents and my cousins both took trips out here, they were both like, wait, what is Malibu? Where like, is the why? Malibu yeah. part? Yeah, well, there's so not a lot of shopping. Yeah. There's a couple little shopping centers, and you have to like. It, it's just about nature. There's these beautiful hiking trails, those Santa Monica Mountains. This is the only city that has a mountain range bisecting it. Um, you can get lost up there. I have gotten lost. It's gorgeous. Um, they don't have an Erewhon, right? They don't they have an Erewhon yet. Okay. Yeah. I'm, That's scary. We fingers get them, crossed they get one. Yeah. So the numbers have to work. <laughs> they have to crunch them. And yeah, but the, there's one in the Palisades now. So it, yeah. in an emergency, they yeah, could yeah. go there or Calabasas. Oh, it checks yeah, yeah. out, yeah. But yeah, no, fascinating stuff, especially yeah. um, for those of us who live here. But yeah, you know, it was Chumash land originally. And then this family, the Ridge family, took over Malibu and they gated it off. And the federal government wanted to build a railroad through it. And so the, that family and the government fought for years and then the government won. Wow. And so uh, that was all owned by a family at a point too, which is so absurd. These wealthy settlers. Bro, I mean, this is scarier than Stephen King at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Should I? I don't know. Well, do you what have else? Any other Let's books? keep rolling. Yeah, yeah Cam, I got, what do you have? I'm going by memory here. So I would say. You know what? I think while we're shitting on rich people, have some? let me Let's interrupt okay, with yeah. this capitalist realism. I just read this the last couple months. Have you guys, have you read it? I've heard a lot about it. I have not read it. I'd been hearing a lot about it. A lot of people were recommending it to me. This guy, Mark Fisher, he's, he's deceased now, but man, what a genius. Um, just sort of rolls off the basis that these other writers created, which is that it's easier to imagine an end of the world than it is an end of capitalism, an end to capitalism. And through that thesis, and it is. We're all like, fuck, man, That's the world's crazy. ending. It's like, or, but we're never like, fuck, man, why don't we just like stop this machine for a second yeah. and like figure things out? And it's because, as he describes so well, how we perceive reality is indecipherable from the machine. 
and from the reality that's been superimposed over us since we were little kids. And, you know, you can agree or disagree. I, I happen to agree. He, but he also writes these really, it's like in pieces, little essays too. One of them is about the movie Heat. Have you guys seen that? The Michael Mann movie? Big time. So De Niro versus Pacino. They're kind of the same guy. Yeah cop criminal he talks about how like in the 70s all the criminal movies were about families the godfather and you know so on and so forth and by the time we get to the 90s it's just two lone wolves it's a lone wolf criminal and the whole thesis of de niro's character in that movie is like you got to be willing to drop everything and leave at the turn of a dime can't get attached to anyone god damn and it's like so indicative of the perfect specimen to this system yeah. of living and conducting transactions in a marketplace. And yeah, I, I really uh, love Just, this book. My favorite of the year so but far. But let me ask you something. Without capitalism, how could you lowball people on Facebook marketplace? I mean, there are downsides. There are downsides yeah. to giving up the giving up the It feels dream. really good. It Dude, feels one time so I good. accidentally listed, um, I was trying to sell a shoe rack for five bucks, some crappy Amazon one. And I accidentally posted it in a Facebook like subleasing uh, group, whatever. So it was like, like I was saying, this shoe rack is for rent for five bucks, <laughs> and I just got clowned on so hard by people. You had to start blocking people. Did you become a meme or something? I did, we just deleted the. Fa- I mean, I just couldn't. It was brutal. It was handle it. Pretty Dang. bad display. Yeah. So that's like a real Gen Z faux pas. Yeah. To mm-hmm. land in the wrong place, like because that's Facebook, a, that's a boomer mistake. I don't know right? Facebook. That's a millennial mistake. Yeah. <laughs> well, you guys were talking about how you're probably our first Gen Z guest. I think you're right. Ali Mikowski might be. Um, She's on the edge. We're we're cusp. We're both 25. <clears throat> okay. So we're Gen Z millennial in, cusps. We were born in 98. Yeah. We're Gen Z, but identify as millennials, probably. Okay. Fair. That's uh, kind of you. That's generous of you because I feel like Gen Z is getting to what millennials have unfortunately not kind of kind of failed at. Not to our, I don't blame us. But do you think yeah. Gen Z is cringe? No, I think they're cool. Yeah. Yeah. Every time I meet like one of you guys, I'm like, dang, they're cool. Uh, yeah. So it's like the opposite. It's like, well, yeah, we kind of. No, I don't think cringe at all. And I mean, I bring it up because of reading. Yeah, my last guest, Jeff, was saying like, here's a book for your younger listeners. I was like, do we have younger listeners? I think we do. Yeah, um, yeah. But so. yeah, do you, it honestly feels like your generation is really coming in. You grew up with the internet from the get-go. And so now yeah. the physical world holds more of an allure to you. Is that true at all? I, I, I guess I, the slower world, I mean. I just feel yeah. like Gen Z reads a lot, but am I wrong on that? Um... Because the, the the stereotype is that you don't. You're all addicted to your phones. But I don't know. I get but, a lot. And, and also, real quick, I will say, like, to that point, addicted to your phones, TikTok, like, book talk is massive. Right. And book talk is, like, if, you know, TikTok getting banned or whatever. It's like book talk really helps, I think, a lot of authors sell copies of books that maybe they otherwise wouldn't have that, like, instantaneous oh, promotion definitely. for free. 100%. Yeah. I mean, I, it is tough, though, because it's like I feel like a lot of our generation and younger they just or it's like a lot of pivot away from like even like tv and movies and i don't even know like i personally don't know that many like big readers you don't. either yeah um and i don't know if that's just my circle because <laughs> also i think what's funny is i feel like i've uh, absorbed so much of like uh literary uh like uh stories and stuff i absorbed so much of it through just like twitter and being on twitter for years i feel like i it was so much like osmosis of like uh how books ended so i had like a lot of stuff spoiled for me but like i got like the arcs of what these books were about just for, through people's like dumb tweets and like making jokes about those books yeah um so i in a way i guess i've read a lot uh uh just through twitter um that's what it feels like but it, it is hard for me even to find the time to sit down and read still um, yeah okay. yeah because it's also like when you're getting because we both work well, he works a nine to five. I do a lot of freelance, which is just crazy hours. But it's like at the end of like working, it's like when you've just been crushed, it's like having to open a book, even like a Kindle makes it easier, but it's like it's so much easier just to scroll. Yeah. No, it's designed that way. Yeah. It's designed to be easy. It feeds you what your mind wants, right? Yeah. yeah. And books challenge us at times. <clears throat> I, I do say like, hey, read a book that's more addictive than the Internet. Yeah. Like you bring up Stephen King. It's like, yeah, whoever whoever gives you that like juice in your brain yeah. and and don't judge how or why you know yeah, oh, yeah like 
whatever the genre may be or, or the subject matter, it's like, because you ultimately just feel better. If well, I read in the bathtub versus if I have my phone in the bathtub, yeah. big difference. The phone in the bathtub, it, it might as well be a toaster that you're about to drop in <laughs> on yourself. You know, it's like yeah. one step away. Well, bro, I'm um I'm reading this book called, uh, it's called Book of the New Sun. It's okay. like a four part fantasy series. I've talked Pete's ear off about it, but it's like, the one thing that's hit me so hard with it. So it's like this sci-fi slash fantasy set in the future where it's like these rich people live in space and then the earth is like so fucked that it's like medieval. So you think it's like fantasy. It's not. It's sci-fi. And like the main character works and like there's all these guilds and he's like in the torturer's guild. But it's so dense and it's like a great piece of art in that it's like designed to be reread to fully grasp what it's doing. And I'm like, that is the thing about like books versus like content and what makes some content great is like the rewatchability because so much of scrolling is like you see it and then it's the next one but it's like something that is like really worth it is like holy shit i want to go back and like look at this again yeah layers yeah yeah so true that's so cool so you're did you finish the four books or where are you at and yeah, would I, you i finished them would yeah. you reread them oh 100 percent. wow yeah it's great because it's like the <clears throat> fantasy where it's like a lot of the made up words it's designed for you to use your imagination as opposed to like i tried reading dune and i couldn't get into it because it's like i can't be flipping back and forth between a dictionary of like made up words yeah i can't be going to but and fro does dune have its own dictionary yeah in the back of the book i can't like, touch that book you I gotta learn all stuff. this cra- i can't be doing that there are some books that you just kind of know you can't touch i it sat on my shelf for yeah. years and i just never pick it up dude I, there's some resistance to it I bought it at a bookstore in Seattle because I went in and I asked if they had any Stephen King and they straight up like laughed. They're like, no, (laughs) they're like, no, bro, we don't, we don't carry that. And they're like, and the guy was talking my ear off. He's like, bro, I think what you need to read is Dune. And I read it. I'm like, this book sucks. The movies were great. And that's the pretentiousness that I think also gets in the way with reading it's like yeah you feel you have to hit these marks especially when you become savvy to the culture and you're like okay these are the prestigious people these are the ones you should scoff at and it's like no read the ones you like it's like i am by i'm just like not a big fantasy person so then it's also to level it off though i also don't think i'll read infinite jest for the same reason of the the footnotes yeah the footnotes footnotes, it's if there's like more than five pages at the back of a book explaining stuff no we can't be doing that it's tough yeah it's tough it's really because then you're you're doing homework yeah and actually i read infinite jest and i kind of like I wasn't super dedicated to the footnotes and then yeah. you come to find out that like oh no those were kind of imperative you needed to <laughs> and like people keep one bookmark at the front one at the yeah. back and yeah I just wasn't having it so I read the book you need like surgical tools to like yeah read a book, right and just, like, I can't yeah I I'm with I mean, you but I mean his whole point was yeah. to fail you in entertaining you he wanted you to do the legwork to the point where you got beyond entertainment because the whole book is an indictment on how entertainment numbs us to ourselves in the world. Yeah. So he made the book purposefully dense and difficult wow. so to try he to like make a statement. You, yeah. Well, he, he got, got no, it. And it works. He got my <laughs> and it works. And hard. in him doing that, okay. he kept a lot, a lot of people away. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, you know, uh, pretentious or not that that's what I understand the goal was with that book dude that let me just say Cormac McCarthy that just reminds me of he has this quote or Pete I think you told me this about how like people had like asked him like do TED talks or like speak about his books and he's like he's like everything I ever needed to say is in those books yeah it's like no additional things ever yeah I read a a, a memoir by Kurosawa the filmmaker yeah and mm-hmm. it's so good and he ends his book the same way he's like and I kind of just feel like stopping right here. And if you need anything else to, you want to know about me, just go watch my movies. Like that's polite as hell. I like Love that. It. So respectful. Love it. And uh, the Richard Hell memoir I just read, same thing. He does the same thing. He's like, and this is when I stopped being a musician and became a writer. And I don't feel like you need to know much about my life as a writer because that's kind of a boring life. Yeah. And respect. Just, yeah, that's respect. Wow. Yeah, when people know how when to put it down, that's... uh. That's nice. Have you um, have you read Blood Meridian? I have. Just touching on Cormac. Yeah. He's definitely my favorite author. He is? Yeah. For what reasons? Um, dude, it's just like, he'll be writing shit that's just like, he laughed so deeply in his throat. 
Yeah. Things like that that just like stick with me or I'm like, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> I always call it like <laughs> thunderclappy because it's just like this it's kind of big funny grandiose, read, yeah. like vivid lightning smacking the the hillside, thunder booming kind of language, at least Blood Meridian. I, I'm sure some of his other books are a little more understated. Uh, but yeah, Blood Meridian definitely turned my stomach um, yeah. just grisly. I mean, it was supposed to, right? It was supposed to be kind of... Um, violent it's just a violent book right i like the thunderclap thing because it's like the lightning strike hits you for it's like it's gone an instance like you read it and then it hits you after how like oh well, that was like a great like the 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 thunder hits you after where you're it, it like, does it right sinks in finally well and, that's and crazy to that point as a metaphor when i saw no country for old men the movie i haven't read the book i like hated it and then just thought about it for years like every coen brothers movie but Cormac McCarthy being the writer of that story. Uh, it makes sense. Yeah, dude, the way he writes, it's just so crazy. I mean, the way he, like, would describe the most boring, like, landscapes, like, it's just so beautiful. Like, you could picture it. Yeah. And and a lot of, like, what he writes about, it's like, you could picture something. I don't know what it is, <laughs> but it's just, like, the concoctions of words he uses. It's like, it's like nightmarish or something. Yeah, nightmarish. It's a crazy mind. Yeah, that's a good Cormac word, too. You throw that in there. Yeah. Nightmare. It's also, I feel like there's all these little, like, breadcrumbs of, like, things that are, like, different, like, red herrings or something. With that, I remember it's, like, the main character was, like, born under a meteor shower or something. In Blood like, Meridian? Yeah, just, like, these weird things. I'm like, is this... So, or, like, these little details alluding that it's, like, a way bigger picture. Like, you could think about things differently. Yeah. So is that what you liked about it? Beyond the language, was there anything in this the story of Blood Meridian that is so memorable? Or are you just I, saying I truly the impression? Can't. It's dude, it's like the impression yeah. and the urge to like I need to like reread this book like once every three years. Okay. He's on a timer. It's just so <clears throat> yeah, our Corey put me on that book. Yeah, our mutual friend Corey. He put me on um All the Pretty Horses first. I read that. And then I read No Country for Old Men. Then Blood Meridian. And then I read like um, Sutri or Sultry. By okay, Sutri. Sutri. Thanks. So. And I'm just like, that's when we're just going off the rails. It's like people talking about like squishing babies, okay, like destroying babies and stuff. And okay. it's like you take the violence to a level where I'm like, I don't even know what I'm reading anymore. I mean, we were just talking David Foster Wallace. He had this short story about this baby who I'm, I can't even go into it. It's it's, and it's it brutal. Just like you're like, wow. Some so some writers really will go there and that's yeah. you know that's the art form there was a Cor cormac mccarthy double feature at the movie theater near my apartment and we were gonna go see it and then like an hour it was all the pretty horses and no country for old men oh nice and then like an hour or two before my girlfriend and i were like i, I don't think we're in any kind of mood to go take in this heavy art for four hours like it, it is and that's what it, it's heavy good art. art like it's let's rich. go get some ice cream yeah. like we need to raise our mood we're not trying to like bring it down further yeah. Yeah. You kind of need to live in a bourgeois space sometimes. Like I feel like independent film and some of these some of this literature happened in these like sort of fa false boom times in America where some people in this thin thread of thriving people could really go to that dark place cuz their lives were otherwise comfortable. Yeah. But I don't know, do you find that like based on how your life is going does the book the kind of book you read change? Um, yeah, def I mean, sometimes it's like, like a book like that, I'll read it when I'm just like, I remember I was like going through something at the time and I'm like, okay, this, I mean, this is so like deep and destructive, like the story of it that I'm like, all right, my situation isn't like that crazy. Right. Oh yeah. Put it into perspective. You know, it's a, yeah, great perspective. Yeah. And sometimes when you're in a dark place, you're like, all right, let's go darker, you know, let's just like live in this <laughs> yeah. energy for a while. I definitely do that with music. I think it's just the, uh the books it's like more of an effort to get to pick up a dark like, book yeah when i'm already feeling that. yeah i don't know if i can <laughs> i haven't done that it's a sustained yeah. effort right yeah yeah Insane. for sure well I, I i brought a random book yeah what is that um annie or no i'm hope i'm saying her name right she's kind of she's gaining i mean i think she, no she's like i think she's won a nobel prize is this, uh, this is not an undercover um author by any means but basically the entire book is her obsession with a young russian diplomat and she's this french woman and it's okay. just like her Ooh. she's obsessed with this guy okay. and she goes into 
intimate, intimate detail, and she doesn't let up. It's her soul. It's just the sole basis of this story. And I don't know, there's something fascinating about someone who's willing to lose themselves to a singular pursuit or a singular relationship or person and how that brings them their entire well-being or destitution. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think there's some like a healthy person living yeah. a healthy life would not want that. But when you find it in literature, it uh, it boils down one isolated aspect of ourselves that's pretty interesting. Yeah. And to write, on, write about it on the other side of being brought down by it, like of being through the looking glass almost of like reflecting on that period. Yeah, it's yeah. an interesting element. Right, right. she survived. Yeah. She survived enough to write about it. And yeah. it's just this feverish diary, um, basically that I thought would be kind of a good random one to bring to you guys. I okay. don't know why. Middle Excellent age, mid, midlife crisis material to the Gen Zs. I That's, think I think there's nothing more frightening. I don't think Stephen King could scare you like no, this. No. Never too early to start on mid age, midlife uh, crisis that's reading. The, that's the that's the spirit. Honestly, guys, I feel like this was a great conversation. Yeah, we didn't even goof off as much as no, uh, I came in to goof, and I kind of failed at that. No, so, you brought uh, in some really uh, lovely stories and takes on them and i've really enjoyed this conversation thank you it's been fun and thank you so much for being on the show we're gonna bring out our new segment where we read listeners book club recommendations and i'm hoping you guys will stick with me for that yeah cam and pete thanks for joining me for our new segment on turek books we're reading our listeners book recommendations there have been so many good ones pouring in but uh we could only do a few And we're happy to uh, start with this one coming in from coming in from our listener, Liam McGinnis. Hey there, I'm Liam, a senior philosophy and journalism student, I believe he means at Salisbury University. And in my philosophy of travel class, we just finished reading Invisible Cities by Italo Calvino which our previous guest Jeff did talk about. It's an imagined dialogue between Mongol Emperor Kublai Khan and young Marco Polo. In the book, Marco is attempting to describe the endless cities of the world and of the vast Mongol Empire to an aging Khan who has seen little of the land he somehow calls his. It's a fascinating read that can be read repeatedly and in different ways, directions, or perspectives. I feel like this book transcends time and space in a super unique way that culminates in a description of the patterns of living and dreaming that creates, destroys, or renders invisible the cities of the world. As a young person, frankly verging on apathy but fighting so hard to keep relentlessly seeking the good, this was a story I needed to read. Calvino makes a poignant argument against colonialist and imperialist mindsets using endless analogy and metaphor to demonstrate the sickening sickening emptiness of a world conquered. This is a great read. I wish I could speak more on it and frankly hope you read it so I can hear what you think on the pod. Well, you're going to hear Jeff Loveness talk about it the week prior, but we needed to hear you talk about it here too because um, I really appreciate what you say. The email goes on to say, P.S., I want to say how much I appreciate your work and your voice. I'm editor-in-chief of the student paper at Salisbury called The Flyer and have a massive piece about to be published the day after my graduation that will expose blatant institutional structural racism at work at our university. So I'd love to plug our Instagram. It's at Salisbury Flyer. I hope to hear Calvino talked about on the pod. And if you are ever in the position that you're looking for employees, writers, like-minded, young and hip friends, give me a shout. Thank you, Liam. We appreciate it. We wish you... Best of luck with your with your article. It sounds like it's in good faith, and and um, yeah, you'll make it better for the next year's students. You're doing the right ongoing. thing. Yeah, future students. Yeah, if your heart's in the right place and uh, bringing real journalism to systemic issues, that's really important. So thank you for writing in, and yeah, hopefully you listen to Jeff Loveness talk all about this book, which I really want to read too. And maybe these boys have read some Italo Calvino. I don't know. Have you? I haven't. But do you think I have? I think, yeah, you have. Bro, I have. All right. I've read one. Which one? Um, The one with the train. Cosmic Com. Oh. Yeah. Uh, Midnight Trap. Yes. If on a Midnight Trap. Yes. Okay. Amazing. Here comes another another write-in from John Schilder. Hey, Turek. The Indifferent Stars Above by Daniel James Brown. 
This book is an incredible look into people of the Donner Party in the Oregon Trail, the harrowing tale that follows them and other families from the plains of Illinois to the salt flats of Utah to the snowy banks of Nevada in search of the promised land, quotations, of California. The book, is both, the, the book is both fascinating and disgusting, sobering and intoxicating. There is cannibalism that is discussed at length, yes, but the real magic of this book is the depths in which it goes to show our true human spirit. Our search for prosperity and security for family, our ability to persevere in the face of adversity, and what happens when that spirit finally breaks. <clears throat> There is a lot to discuss, from the poor hired hands who worked for pittances and slept in the cold, to the rich settlers who had velveteen car carriages who had to eventually throw everything overboard to keep their oxen going. You gotta re give it a read if you haven't. Love your stuff. John S. J. Schilder um, on Instagram. J-S-C-I-E-L-D-E-R. Thank you for that, John. I'll trust any man named John. That's my dad's name. Okay. Fair enough. And I feel like anytime you meet a John, yeah, it's a good guy. Right? I I'm John Carpenter, great director. Was John Wayne Gacy John. a serial killer? Yeah, yeah. But that might have been like a J-O-N situation. Yeah. Okay, fair, fair. Um, well, thank you for that. I need to... That seems like a pretty fun... Like, not fun read, but that does seem... <clears throat> it does seem compelling really and full of drama and, like, very metaphorical for, you know, just the toil of living and and also yeah the westward expansion folly yeah um, it's kind of getting into some blood meridian vibes a little bit yeah the brutality of that era the manifest destiny of yeah just a whole continent of of things that are just like you should not be fucking with that's yeah. right in a in an alien land that yeah. doesn't belong to the settlers well thank you all so much for tuning into this episode of turek books Cam and Pete, can't thank you enough for joining me. This was a great conversation. Thank you to the listeners for writing in and for listening. Remember to like, share, subscribe, thumbs up, whatever. I think all that stuff really helps. And, uh, yeah, we're looking forward to uh, continuing to talk about books. Thanks for listening. This was fun. Thank you for listening to another episode of Turek Books. Be sure to like, subscribe, thumbs up, any kind of thing that could help us get listened to or watched by more people. We really appreciated having you and hope to see you again next week with a new guest and plenty of books. Take care until then.